well a very hearty good evening uh, one and all on behalf of dhankanal science center a unit of national council of science museums uh, ministry of culture government of india i welcome you all for this webinar on theme gravitational waves the music of cosmos at the outset i welcome uh, dr indrani banerjee ma'am assistant professor on department of physics and astronomy uh, national institute of technology uh, raurkela and uh, simultaneously i welcome all our esteemed uh, viewers followers friends uh, as you all know gravitational waves first uh, discovered in the year 2015 by ligo detectors that mark one of the greatest triumphs of albert einstein's uh, general theory of uh, relativity which was predicted uh, by albert einstein in the year 1916 uh, gravitational waves are ripples in space time caused by some of the most violent and uh, energetic processes in the universe even the 2017 nobel prize in physics was awarded to uh, keith thorne very very sand or nr basis for the discovery since 2015 there have been more than 50 detections of gravitational wave signals till date in today's talk indrani ma'am is going to explain how gravitational waves appear naturally in einstein's general relativity the difficulties and challenges faced in constructing a successful gravitational wave detector that will be discussed besides that the future prospects with gravitational wave astronomy in unraveling future prospects in unraveling the deeper mysteries of the universe that will be also discussed uh i request all our esteemed viewers please note down at the end and uh, we will have uh, an interactive session before we start uh let me give uh, a brief introduction about uh, indrani ma'am ma'am did her uh, phd in 2014 from indian institute of science uh, bangalore even before graduation uh, madam madam was senior research associate in uh, indian institute of science bangalore she did her post doctoral research in sn bose national center for basic sciences kolkata and a research associate in indian association for the cultivation of science kolkata at present she is working as assistant professor astronomy and astrophysics group department of physics and astronomy uh, the one of the renowned national institute of technology raurkela odisha with a very short notice ma'am has uh, accepted our request thanks a lot uh, indrani ma'am for uh, accepting our request uh, to deliver this um, talk uh ma'am has uh, the uh, publications and uh, her resume almost uh, nine pages if i go through his and every line i think it will be 40 45 minute but still i'll uh, name a few of them uh, even uh, madam was selected on uh, un undergraduate associate at saha institute of nuclear physics in the year 2004 
even qualified jam all india rank 63 in the year 2007 uh, qualified just all india rank 98 since graduation uh, no doubt uh, brilliant one yeah means uh, uh, quite knowledgeable and the madam has qualified west bengal college service commission interview uh, 77 rank out of more than 1500 students in the year 2019 also and um, ma'am's publications in uh, refereed journals uh, journals uh, the recent one in the year 2021 was, was on theme unifying and asymmetric bounds to the dark energy in stern simon fr gravity uh, even last year uh, signatures of einstein maxwell dilation axiom gravity from the observed jet power and the radiative efficiency so like this uh, three four pages i'll skip we'll uh, take advantage of madam's interaction even in journals uh, madam has submitted uh, several papers on theme along with some other um, professors uh, Constraining, uh, constraining mass of Cygnus X1 from analysis of the hard state spectral data using TCAF solution. Even publications in peer-reviewed conferences proceedings on theme nucleosynthesis inside accretion disks and outflows formed uh, during core collapse of massive stars. And uh, other pub publications, especially for uh, non-science background uh, there are several links i was going through one of the uh, links it was really excellent and i request ma'am even to share with our audience uh, those uh, links of course those who have already registered um, will share those links for them also and uh, at present ma'am is in a teaching profession as i have told you um, assistant professor in nit raurkela and several students are doing PhD and uh, projects under the guidance and supervision supervision of uh, Indrani ma'am. Uh, I'm not going to uh, the details. Uh, we'll take advantage of uh, madam's interaction, uh, uh, deliberation uh, on this uh, uh, most curious uh, subject, gravitational waves, the music of cosmos. Uh, really, we are really very, very uh, happy and uh, honored to have such a luminary with us today. I am sure her deliberations and interaction will definitely enrich and enlighten all of us. So without wasting uh, much time, uh, now, may I request uh, Indrani, ma'am, please um, enlighten us. Ma'am, now the platform is yours. Uh, and this uh, deliberation will be live streamed in our uh, NCSM, uh, National Council of Science Museums, uh, social media uh, pages. Uh, I request all our esteemed viewers, please uh, keep yourself muted switch up the video if you have any query uh, you can write to us uh, now my may I request uh, indrani ma'am please uh, take over now the platform is yours indrani ma'am please so thank you very much uh, dr raut for giving me this excellent opportunity to uh, discuss about one of the most exciting discoveries uh, in recent times and it's actually an honor and pleasure on my part to be keep delivering this talk here. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and I'm really privileged to uh, give a talk here today. So I will share my screen here. So, please. Yes. So is the screen visible? Yeah, it will take. Yeah, it's it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
let me go to the full screen mode okay so 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 thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and uh, it's a pleasure to give a talk at dhenkanal science center and uh, today i am here to relate you about the story of uh, two black holes so it began with two black holes and then there are so many things which is unfolding with years so and i will tell you how these gravitational wave signals these can be thought of as the music of the cosmos so let's start with this so this is a story of the dead stars so black holes are dead stars you see that the, there are two black holes of unequal mass they are in spiraling about each other and as they are spiraling and spiraling the okay. distance between them is decreasing okay. and finally you will see that they eventually merge to a single black hole okay and you might have also noted that while they are merging and so while they are in spiraling they are emitting these ripples so denoted by these green waves and finally at the merger stage you will see that these the magnitude of these ripples become very very high so these ripples are essentially the gravitational waves and today i will discuss how these gravitational waves occur as a natural consequence of einstein's general theory of relativity so the video that i just showed it's basically two black holes which merged 1.3 billion years ago and let's see this it's in a distant galaxy far far away from the earth so it's 1.3 billion years ago and then these waves reach the earth so you see that it's making the earth distort right so these waves reached the earth and they reached on 14th of september 2015 so that was the first detection of gravitational waves from two binary black holes and their masses were nearly 30 times the mass of the sun so by the way gravitational wave signals are emitted all the time but then why did we so what is so important about this uh, signal detected in 2015 so we did not have detectors which could detect these signals so these are very very weak signals when they are emitted near the source so if you see at this particular video near the source the amplitude of the signal is very high but we are very very far away from source so that is why to an observer on earth it's like a very weak signal and we need very sensitive detectors carefully engineered and which are exactly our ligo detectors so these signal uh, detectors were ready to detect the signals and the moment they were operational in 2015 the first detection was made so initially there were two detectors so the so the, these waves they reached the earth first in the south pole near the south pole then they traveled all through the earth and finally they were detected first here at the ligo livingston and there is another ligo detector which is at the hanford washington so these so i will tell you later why we needed actually two detectors for detecting these waves Excuse so the first ever signal screen is not visible screen is not visible <coughs> yeah yeah it's visible it is visible now okay. yeah yeah it's visible okay okay so the first okay so the first gravitational wave signal in 2015 the first detection was first made at the livingston this particular detector and 7 milliseconds later the second at uh, this same signal was received by the detector at hanford so we need two signals because 
So you see that there are sources of so there are so many sources of noise, and we have to be very very sure that it is actually coming from that merger of black holes. So if it is so if it is a local noise, then it will be detected only in one of the detectors, but not at the other. But if it is if the same signal is detected by both the detectors, then one can this is this is one of the ways to be sure that at least it is from the uh, merger of black holes. And the distance between them is this 1900 miles, and one can calculate the distance divided by the time, and it should be the speed of light. So the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. And so, as promised, so I told you that this is the music of the cosmos. So whatever signal you detect, I will tell you how the signal looks like. So here it's the frequency of the signal, the frequency plotted with the time. So. so it is when when they are coming close the frequency is less and when they are merging the frequency becomes high so let's hear this the birth cry of a black hole so why do i say it's the birth cry that's because a new black hole is formed after the merger of these two black holes which were nearly 30 times the mass of the sun so that was the first detection the detection was made on 14th of september 2015 and then it involved so the ligo scientific collaboration involved nearly thousands of people and it was not made public right on the detection so people kept it a secret data analysis had to be done because they had to be absolutely sure that it is coming from it's a true gravitational signal and it's not any other environmental noise or anything else so data analysis was done by these this huge collaboration for 5 uh, months and finally the data was made public uh, uh, in Surendra, february 2016 and then the detection was made public after 5 months and since 2015 there have yes, been nearly 50 confirmed detections of gravitational waves so 2015 to 2021 actually there are 53 now so within a span of uh, nearly 6 years we have 53 detections so these events are not very rare just that we did not have the right kind of detector to detect them and then the nobel prize in 2017 was awarded to uh, rainer weiss uh, kip thorne and barry barish for this particular discovery who played a very instrumental role parikita 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 abu both the theoretical as well as in the uh, no, no. The message the the construction of the uh, ligo detectors so that such that huh? so theoretically it was predicted actually back in 2015 when uh, general relativity was uh, proposed by einstein but uh, einstein for 370 believe that the signal can ever be detected given how we double this thing got So this dream became a reality. Now three seven two three five. Within a hundred years, and it's uh, really a coincidence that the uh, general relativity was proposed in 1915 and 2015. Just after a century, the first gravitational wave was. Muta screenshot potay do chidam go. So let's see how these gravitational waves turn out to be a natural consequence of Einstein's general relativity. So. Einstein used his equations. I will tell you very, very uh, briefly how these equations, what these equations are. So he used his equations, and from his equations, it can be shown that when masses accelerate, so as these two masses are inspiring towards each other, we know that they are accelerating, and as they are accelerating, they distort the space-time. Literally, the space in which they are moving. they are distorting that space and these ripples are called gravitational waves so suppose so he but he said that these waves are so weak that humans are unlikely to detect them so now i will uh, relate how these gravitational waves come naturally in this general relativity so but before going to general relativity let us uh, start from the newtonian framework which we are all familiar with so we know that according to newton's law of gravitation so gravity is an attractive force so it's between so there are two masses 
and we know that these two masses attract each other so suppose capital m is the mass of the larger body small m is the mass of the smaller body and suppose there is an attractive force and this r vector is basically so that force is between the line connecting the two masses now it's amazing that the same force which explains how an apple falls on the ground also tells us how the planets move around the sun so this discovery itself is excellent i mean it's an amazing discovery and despite this astounding success of newton's theory it needed to be revisited and let's understand why so now let's carefully analyze newton's theory a bit which uh, so according to newton's second law so we have been talking about newton's law of gravitation but there is also newton's second law and what does it tell us that whenever there is a force on an object it you apply a force to an object it accelerates now what is this so how much will it accelerate a lighter particle accelerates faster when the same force is applied so a heavier particle provides a greater resistance to the acceleration so this mass by lighter heavier so we are basically light by lighter and heavier we are denoting its mass so mass is a means of telling us what is how much resistance it can provide to its acceleration so this mass we call it the inertial mass now come to newton's law of gravitation we just discussed so now there is a heavier body with capital m mass and it attracts a lighter body now the gravity so this law equation number 3 the newton's law of gravitation it tells us that so it uh, the gravitational force acting on a body is proportional to its mass and this mass so this particular mass mg i am denoting these two masses separately because this mg tells us how strongly this uh, mass is coupled to the gravitational field or the gravitational potential created by this larger mass a priori there is no reason to believe that this mass which tells us how strongly the smaller mass is coupled to the larger mass and how much this mass resists to acceleration please understand that this force is not gravitational force it can be forced due to anything you can just push it that is not a gravitational force so these two masses being equal is just a coincidence okay so now we consider suppose the origin of the force here in equation 2 is the gravitational force so then you equate equation 2 and 3 and then we cancel these two masses on both sides from a theoretical point of view this is absolutely not obvious but if we go back to galileo's experiment by dropping two balls of unequal masses he found that they reach the ground at the same time that means so the acceleration due to gravity does not depend on the mass of the object so whether it's a feather or it's a heavy ball they will fall on the ground at the same time so that is essentially cancellation of the inertial mass and the gravitational mass now contrast this gravitational force so gravitational force is very special that way let us con contrast this with electrostatic electrostatic uh, force you see that suppose you equate this force with qe the charge so the acceleration depends on the charge to mass ratio so it is different for different particles for gravitation the acceleration is the same for all particles electrostatic forces can be attractive as well as repulsive for gravitation it's only attraction so now so in newton's theory this cancellation of inertial and gravitational mass is a mere coincidence but einstein sought a deeper reason for this so he asked the question is it just a coincidence he stated that particles experience the same acceleration due to gravity because they share something in common between them otherwise this would have not happened and what is it that they share they fall through the same space and the space is curved and that is why they experience the same acceleration so you see that this there is no equation no mathematics here it's just a new concept it's a paradigm shift so now let's come to einstein's 
framework. So he discarded the idea of describing gravity as a force. So there is no such notion of force which Newton stated that there is this GMM by R square. You can explain certain observations in terms of this kind of force and Newton's theory is not wrong. It comes, it is, it is valid, perfectly correct in a certain approximation when the gravity is weak. So according to gra general relativity, which was proposed by Einstein, so massive objects curve the space-time. Let, let's look at figure eights. You drop a ball on a rubber sheet and you see that it curves the space-time. It's just like that. So if, whenever there is a massive object, so our sun, earth, it curves the space-time. The more massive it is, the more it curves. And our earth is much smaller compared to that of the sun. So the amount of curvature it causes to space-time is much less compared to that of the sun, which is much, much heavier. And therefore, we can treat this Earth as a small body compared moving around this sun and same with all the planets. And why this Earth is accelerating or it's moving in the circular motion? Because it is moving in a curved space time. So for the timing, it is moving in a curved space created by this, by the heavier mass, which is sun. So now, till now, I have been talking only about curved space. But then... Uh, we always hear that uh, there is this one term, space and time. And why did it require to be unified? Because that's because the because of the laws of special relativity. So when we were studying uh, in the early 1900, the motion of relativistic particles, it was found that so the speed of light has to be constant in all in the speed of light in vacuum has to be constant in all inertial frames. Inertial means non-accelerating frames. So in order to, so this was a requirement which was coming from the laws of electromagnetism. And so, on, so when the laws of electromagnetism were not there, if, so Newtonian framework was perfect. But the moment you have to bring in electromagnetism and then there were electromagnetic, uh, so the, you, we, we came to know that light behaves like an electromagnetic wave and it propagates at a particular constant speed. So no signals can travel faster than this particular speed of 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So this requirement gave rise to this unification of space and time. I will not go into the details, but this is the reason we have to unify space time. And then... But then the question is, why do we, so why do laws of physics have to be same in non-accelerating frames? Isn't it a bit special? What happens if we also consider accelerating frames? And exactly Einstein did that. And if you consider accelerating frames, the same two postulates, but now you make it more general. Relax this assumption of inertial frames. You get what you arrive at is Einstein's general relativity. So, then it turns out that if we are studying accelerated frames, it is equivalent to study motion in curved space-time. And if we are limited to inertial frames, that means we are actually studying motion in flat space-time. So that is the chain of argument we follow. So accelerated frames means we have to study motion in curved space-time. And I told you that how it all came about. So now consider so non-inertial frames and curved space-time. So consider motion of a pendulum in a uniformly accelerated bus. For, a, for an observer in the bus, the pendulum experiences no acceleration. Why? Because the bus is accelerating in this direction, so in the negative x-axis, and you see that there is a pseudo-force. We are all familiar with that. And to an observer in the bus who is a non-inertial observer, there is no force. Now for a frame moving with... So suppose this particular observer who is seeing the bus to be moving, okay? So to him, him there is, is this, uh, uh, this uh, so, so they will, so, so to this person, to this lady, this is an accelerated frame. Now suppose, so this is a uniform acceleration. Suppose we have non-uniform acceleration. So that means, non-uniform means at different points in space and time, the acceleration is different. So you have different uh, inertial frames at every point in space and time you have to give a different fictitious force to nullify the effect of the acceleration so you have a series of so that's why we call locally inertial 
and then it was it can be shown that this locally inertial is essentially analogous to the idea of locally flat so it's like a small patch of a curved sphere appears flat but actually it's curved it appears flat similarly a small if you apply an uh, a fictitious force to a non uniformly accelerated observer to that observer it is perfectly inertial so this analogy had a very important role in einstein's relativity and then so it, so i said that in special relativity we are dealing with flat space and flat space means pythagoras theorem we know that so consider this flat space we know that we are very familiar with our pythagoras theorem it's in two dimensions figure e and this figure is for three dimensions so this the modulus of the vector square is ax square ay square and az square so now consider the same pythagoras theorem in three dimensions but now we will consider a small local patch so that is why differentials dx square dy square dz square and now those of you who are familiar with matrices you can easily show that you can split this equation like this it is so you can just do this multiplication matrix multiplication and this is so this particular matrix so this particular matrix is the flat matrix okay so pythagoras theorem is valid only in flat space if you have a curved space the sum of the angles of a triangle is no more 180 degrees and you have to go beyond that and general relativity is essentially studying motion in flat space in curved space note that in equation 7 the coefficients of dx square dy square dz square these are all unity what matters is that these coefficients are one now let's go to a more general case what will happen if we have more like all these elements are not constants so we have off diagonal elements and all these are functions of x y z so that is basically when we will have some functions say f1 f2 and f3 multiplied to the coefficients and that is our curved space and then i said that we have to unify space and time so you have to bring in this so along with pythagoras theorem the dx square dy square and dz square you have to bring the dt square to keep the dimensions bring in the speed of light and just split up in the same way so this is the flat metric in special relativity in general relativity you make it more general there are coefficients there will be off diagonal terms so terms like dx dy dt dx that something like that and so you will have a non flat metric okay so this is essentially the so when you are so this is so metric is the fundamental quantity we are dealing with in general relativity metric tells you how to measure the distance between two points so special relativity does not take into account acceleration in general relativity it is taken into account general relativity so when you are, so when you are taking acceleration i told you that it is equivalent to considering motion in curved space time and therefore it is then it became very natural that when you are studying motion in curved space time there is no notion of force and that notion of force which arose in newton's law of gravitation had to be abandoned it is essentially there is a some heavier mass or and you also know that mass is equivalent to energy so there is some heavier mass some mass energy and that curves the space time we have some smaller particles which also curves the space time but to a much lesser extent compared to the heavier mass and it moves so it accelerates because of it's moving in a curved space so now i will just sum this up newton's picture versus einstein's picture so we are so suppose you have a mass distribution denoted by this density so we have some density right rho and at different points in space x y z the density is different so given the mass distribution we can calculate what kind of gravitational potential it creates so that is give essentially given by this factor phi so this uh, quantity phi which is the gravitational potential and once you know how a particular mass uh, creates this gravitational potential 
we can use newton's second law and tell that how other masses coupled to this gravitational potential or move in this uh, potential so that is second law the same analogous thing in the einsteinian picture is that the mass distribution here denoted by rho a more general quantity is the energy momentum tensor and this tells so th be because of the presence of this energy or mass it will curve the space time that is the right hand side in the left hand side of einstein equation how it curves the space time so this quantity rab and r these are constructed from the metric which i told you just discussed and you know that metric is function of the time and the three xyz coordinates so metric and its derivatives i will not go into the explicit forms so given a matter energy this is einstein's equation which tells you how it curves the space time around it and then the next thing is given a curved space how it is generated i do not care now i know it's curved by some means how will a test particle move in it so that is given by the geodesic equation so here also you have acceleration here also we have acceleration okay and this particular quantity it's again constructed from the derivatives of the metric if it is a flat metric let me go back once again you know that this is the derivatives of the metric will be zero so there will be no acceleration if it is a curved metric these are functions of t x y z so you will have non trivial derivatives and you will have the left hand side of equation 12 which is non zero similarly the right hand side of equation 13 will also be non zero so this is essentially the idea and this made john wheeler uh, give his famous comment that space time tells how matter to how should matter curve so it is this equation so space time uh, sorry space time tells how matter to move and matter tells Uh, how space time to curve so but this matter here is a different matter okay these two matters are not the same matter tells how space time to curve it's basically this matter which is the bigger mass it tells how space time to curve and space time tells once the curve curve space is formed so then this so how a lighter particle will move in that curve space time is given by equation 13 so this is just the brief summary and then you can show so this gravitational waves so and so now we have learned that gravitational waves are basically so whenever there is some mass present in the space time it will curve the space around it now suppose there are moving masses so it will the distortion in the space time will continuously change and that translates to the fact that these are ripples in the fabric of space time right so this is just what i showed and more closer they come the uh, they distort the space time even more and therefore the amplitude of the gravitational waves become larger and larger towards the merging phase when they are close to the merger so then these gravitational waves after traveling through billions of years in the galaxy where they are first formed they pass through the interstellar medium so many galaxies in between and finally reach our milky way galaxy and then the earth and then so these events were happening so these are very frequent events but then these are also very weak signals so we did not have the right kind of detector but once these detectors were um, launched so ligo livingston and hanford it took it was a very very difficult job immediately the first signal was detected so why is detection of gravitational waves important because it tests einstein's theory with unprecedented rigor but before i go into it uh, am i audible to all yeah yeah, yeah. audible no yeah. okay, yes, so if yes. there are any questions uh, one can uh, please feel free to ask me in stop me in between and ask the question Okay. Okay. So, your lecture, your lecture, madam, your speech is over right now. No, 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 right no, no, no. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Bandhupati so, ji, you please uh, note down the points. Uh, at the end, we'll give some time so that we can have uh, interaction with uh, ma'am. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. 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 So then, uh, the next question is so. So this is a prediction of Einstein's general relativity. 
so that was that prediction was made uh, once this theory was proposed in 1915 1916 and then so why people were so interested about detecting these waves why it takes so much of pain because first of all it so it is it tests so it is one of it is it will so einstein's theory was uh, tested several times by uh, motion of mercury perihelion precession and bending of light okay but apart from that this will be another independent test of einstein's theory okay now it provides uh, proof for the existence of black holes so einstein himself uh, so when the black holes were first uh, predicted theoretically so nobody believed that such objects could exist in the universe these were bizarre objects so there is this event horizon and nothing can come out of it and uh, he himself einstein himself believed that these objects do not exist there must be something some problem in the theory but then in the 1960s black holes were the discovery of the black hole started taking place so that was through electromagnetic signals that uh, that are emanated from the surroundings so how the surroundings yeah, which uh, session, the data login fall question. into this how the surrounding uh, particles which fall into the black hole the kind of signals they emit from that signals the electromagnetic signals people indirectly inferred about the existence of black holes and now this gravitational wave is a direct detection so these ripples are directly detected so it opens up a new window apart from electromagnetic signals it opens up a new window to explore the cosmos it has the potential to tell us about the origin of the universe and it can also reveal new physics about which we have no idea it can so that is also uh, very eagerly awaited so now the differences between electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves the first thing is that we know that electromagnetic waves so the particle corresponding to electromagnetic wave we have photons and these photons are propagating in the space time and so these are vibrations so you can also uh, consider them as so these are waves vibrations traveling through space time but gravitational waves are the space itself is vibrating okay so so something vibrate uh, passing uh, traveling through the space time and here the vibration the gravitational waves are essentially vibrations of the space time the electromagnetic waves can be easily absorbed it can be easily scattered however gravitational wave for gravitational waves once they are emanated from the source the chances of scattering absorption is minimal so that is why although they are very weak signals if you can detect them you uh, since they are not scattered not absorbed they can tell you so they are more purer signals they can tell, give you a, uh, they can reveal greater information about the more correct information about the source which is uh, from which they are emitted okay and of course these are incoherent emissions from atoms molecules but gravitational waves are coherent emissions due to bulk motion of matter itself because the matter is moving distortions in space time and these are traveling through the uh, spaces so many gravitational wave sources may not be detected electromagnetically so that is again so we have that is why uh, it said that the detection of gravitational waves opens up a new window to the cosmos so you get independent another chance to understand the various sources in the universe from by another independent um, uh, measurement so how does the ligo detector work so what is the principle the principle is very simple it starts with the idea of michelson interferometer okay so you have a laser light out here and then there is a beam splitter we have all studied michelson interferometer so then it goes to and there are two mirrors it reflects through these mirrors so beam splitter it splits so there is a reflection here and there is a transmission here so the reflected ray goes and hits this mirror reflects there are several reflections back and forth so this is a slight advancement in actual michelson interferometer we do not have this mirror and this mirror so these are inserted for reasons i will tell you later so but uh, so there are some back and forth uh, reflections and finally when they come here and also this laser light it comes here it so there is an interference so in just normal ordinary interference of 
less monochromatic so coherent sources so why laser beam because there is we need only one single wavelength so there is a coherent source so and finally, finally they will, they will uh, uh, interfere, interfere and, and they will be detected at the photo so now let's see now once the, when the gravitational wave passes so when uh, there is no gravitational wave the entire arrangement is made in such a way that so the length of the mirrors uh, the length of these arms are 4 kilometers you can imagine how huge they are so these are 4 kilometer arms and they are uh, arranged in such a way that without a gravitational wave there is a destructive interference so no light will be detected at the photo detector here so let's see this now so here is the beam splitter, the detector, the mirrors, and finally you detect the uh, interfered light at the detector. So it comes and splits and then there is... So this motion, this motion of the two mirrors is when a gravitational wave passes. Why? Because it's a ripple in the space-time. So let's forget time for the time being. So it, this, it's causing ripples in the space. Now mirrors are existing in the space. So everything which is there in the space will uh, experience this vibration. So it will stretch on one end and then it will squeeze. And in the next moment, it will stretch the other end and this one will be squeezed. So let us see it now. You see the laser light comes. And then it hits one of the mirrors, reflects, comes back, back to the beam splitter. Interference <laughs> happens. In the photo detector, there is a destructive interference. So this is the arrangement. So there will be absolutely there will be no, no light in the detector. So that means there is no gravitational wave. Now a gravitational wave. Suppose a gravitational wave passes, so it's a matter of chance. Such events are happening, and it's passing. It's passing through LIGO detector. So now, what will happen is, you see that the waves do not exactly cancel. So they are one part is stretching, the other part is squeezing, and there is some light signal in the detector. So when you detect this light signal, that means in the LIGO detector. It means that it's because of these gravitational waves this has happened. So the interference uh, is because of the interference of, it's basically ordinary interference of laser beams. But, so as we all know, so there is, so suppose these two waves are interfering constructively, so you will see a louder wave. For LIGO, they are interfering destructively. So there is no light at all to begin with. But the moment <coughs> the gravitational wave passes, there is a phase difference between the two. So that phase difference is no more pi by 2. So there is not exact cancellation. And that will lead to a light signal in the photo, in the light detector. And the moment you detect this light signal means that there is a gravitational wave which has passed through the detector. And from the detected signal, which is the interference of these laser beams, you try to conclude about the source. So now let's come to the story. Why did it take so long to detect the gravitational waves? So how much, so when these gravitational waves are passing through these detectors, so let's have an idea about how much they are stretching the space. So it's a four kilometer long detector and it will increase. So I said that it will increase the length and one end because the space itself is stretching and it will decrease the length at one at the, at the other end. And how much will it increase? The increase is one part in 10 to the power 21. So imagine that at the distance between Earth and Alpha Centauri, it's in some light years, and the change in the distance happens in just uh, like the dimensions of human hair. So the distance between the two objects are changing. So some, some light year distance. So this distance is four kilometers. And because of this gravitational wave, the four kilometer distance is changing to four point after four point, there are 20 zeros and then a one. That is the small change in distance, which LIGO is detecting. 
so you so now you can imagine how sensitive this detector has to be the arm length is 4 km so this this is one of the reason why one has to keep this arm length as 4 km because the longer one makes the arms the sensitivity so it the, the sensitivity increases so then it required tremendous advancement in technology to finally detect them so it started with joseph weber in university of maryland who came forward with the idea of uh, this gravitational wave detector so there were reasons for this because in the 1960s the black holes first of all it was estimated that these will observe. so there has to be very violent events because even gravitational waves suppose two people's friends are dancing amongst each other they will also create ripples in space time but that is so tiny that it cannot be detected so it has to be very heavy masses so black holes let's so, so the first detection was 32 black holes mass is 30 times the solar mass how much is one solar mass it is 10 to the power 33 grams and 30 times the mass of the sun these two black holes so these two so imagine that they are they are very heavy objects they should distort the space time sufficiently so that they can be uh, detected so that the detector is sensitive enough to catch these signals so first of all there has to be black holes such objects has to be present so in the 1960s those objects were uh, detected electromagnetically so that was one motivation the other thing is that technologically uh, some technological advancements were also taking place example computers lasers so these were also happening so this motivated joseph weber to give it a try to detect the first gravitational wave detector and then kip thorne so one of the nobel laureates who uh, was given the nobel prize in 2017 for gravitational waves so he was inspired by joseph weber and john wheeler who was his own uh, phd guide so then he so he was a graduate student at that time simultaneously reiner weiss so he was another nobel laureate discovery he put forward what kind of detectors so uh, so joe weber uh, he did uh, he made some detection but then it was later on found that it is uh, it's from some other source it's not a uh, correct gravitational wave but then people so he was the first person he's called that's why the father of uh, all the gravitational wave discovery he put other people in it reiner weiss uh, so this like idea of using michelson interferometer in the ligo detector this idea first came from reiner weiss not only that he identified the major noise sources so you can imagine that far far away where these two black holes are merging and then you are, we are detecting such weak signals but there are other sources of noise for example the, a car is moving by somewhere so that will create vibrations that will create more vibrations earthquakes thunderstorms and there are god knows so many noise sources so that has to be properly identified and those sources of noise have also uh, so these sources of noise also need to be eliminated if you want to get the true signal and then he calculated that the sensitivity required for such detectors has so it required measuring motion of mirrors of the order of 10 to the power minus 17 meter and it was very unpromising at that time now arms are so LIGO interferometers were essentially Michelson interferometers, which I just said. Arms are longer than a typical Michelson interferometer. So typical, so if we recall our Michelson Morley experiment, the arms were like 1.3 meters. And LIGO in LIGO detector, its arms are four kilometers. So four kilometer it was increased to that level. Why? Because uh, it will make the signal more to amplify the signal. There are other ways to amplify the signal, that is, put it in the fabry pedo cavities. So this was proposed by uh, w. Ronald uh, P. Drever. So insert two more mirrors, and there will be repeated uh, reflections. So, so the laser beam initially, whatever, so it's of 1064 nanometer, and this will be like 10 watts, but then it will become like megawatt of order uh, power after these reflections and then this recycling technology will have to be used so a lot of technological advancement was required 
and then in 1976 78 the first decision to develop so with all these technological advancements this started occurring to people that this might not be so impossible so that is why the decision to develop gravitational wave detector in caltech and it was led by kip thorne then the experimental group was led by uh, ronald rever and uh, stan witcom and simultaneously at mit rainer wiss was also uh, trying to materialize his ideas and then the collaboration started began beginning in 1984 and then of course uh, and so robbie worked or was uh, made the director of ligo in 1987 because then like people had to people realize that it is not the work of a of one particular group who can do it so we have to need to bring to bring people together and then uh, barry barish who is the third nobel laureate he was so he was working in lhc at that time so kip thon asked him to come and join this particular collaboration so he was uh, he had this uh, expertise in building this large kind of detectors and then the collaboration kept on expanding and now it's like there are like more than 1000 scientists working on this project and then from 2000 to 2010 the initial interferometers were built and eventually the advanced ones were installed but lot and lots of engineering was required and then this might be a question by now to many of you that how to ensure that we are actually detecting a true gravitational wave signal so first of all this 4 4 km long arms have to be there so that's why the arm length is made long the mirrors in the by uh, against which the laser beams are striking so these are heavy mirrors and they are smoothest possible mirrors ever created till date the mirrors suspended by silica threads just twice the thickness of a human hair to isolate them from the environment they are kept on springs and weights to absorb movement from the ground and we have to build at least two detectors why because despite all this but before i go into that the the these tubes so these are actually this these are so this is a small tube but there will be a very large so you see that these are long tubes and it has to be absolutely evacuated so it's one part in 10 to the power 12 atmospheric pressure so that level of vacuum had to be achieved in order to assure that whatever we are detecting it's a true signal so that so then and finally we have to use laser beams because it has to be a coherent source a single wavelength because you are trying to measure distances with uh, changing wavelength it doesn't make any sense right so so many conditions need to be satisfied also the stability of the laser that means the fact that the wavelength just to ensure that this 1064 nanometer laser is not changing its wavelength it's if, even if it is changing the stability is like one part in 10 to the power 20 so point after point 19 zeros and then one that is the magnitude of stability of the laser so so much of uh, engineering had so each of these steps getting the smoothest mirrors the silica threads the the uh, cushioning the mirrors appropriately with springs and uh, springs and weights then the laser beam the the appropriate using the appropriate laser the stability of these laser beam also the creating that uh, vacuum evacuating the tubes so each step is very very difficult and then you have to create not only one but at least two detectors because despite all this suppose you have detected a signal you cannot be very sure that it is the true gravitational wave signal because there are so many uh, ways of uh, there are so many noise sources so if the same signal is detected at the at both the places so there are no local effects one can be at least sure that this is uh, coming this is genuine signal the other reason for building two detectors is that for locating that object in the sky so this is called triangulation 
so you have to pro so it's like you have to produce those rays back and try to see where they meet so it will give you a rough idea that where exactly these gravitational waves were emitted so this means that the more the number of detectors it will give us it will allow us to confine that area better and better and that's why initially there were two ligo detectors and then the virgo detector came up which started uh, giving us data from 2017 and then uh, there are many many proposed uh, gravitational wave detectors so let us now uh, hear from uh, one of the key persons who was involved in this particular detection he started so it's professor rana odikari uh, from caltech who started his uh, on this work uh, from uh, from his guys yes yes Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, ma'am, you are audible. Uh, any questions? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. So, okay. So I will now just show you one. So how the scientists first reacted. So it is from Rana Dikari, who is uh, who was involved in this project for more than two decades, right from his days of uh, graduate studies. So he was a PhD student under Rainer Weiss, who is one of the Nobel laureates. So let's listen to him. Hard to overstate how anomalous. Um, Sunday night, at both places, people are working on the machine, and it's like here, um, there's some stuff going on. Like you look down here, there's just some people whittling away. You know, like Sunday night, it's around midnight, basically, at both places, both teams, without talking to each other, are like, well, tired, it's gone, and so headed back in. They go through the people like you have back here. And they sit down for probably like 20, 30 minutes, and they readjust the controls of the system back. So, so that was the first day it was operational. So they didn't expect any signal to come on the very first day. So that's what he's trying to. Ready for observation, and then they go home. They and went back. Probably before they even arrived at home, that signal came through Louisiana and like Washington. And What's the chance of that? They could easily have just worked for another half hour and then they had any It's not just that it was really anomalous and found something in the first hour, but how strong it was. And we've now uh, looked at the data for the next several months, from then until the end, and that thing has taken that long. Can you tell me about how you first realized that LIGO may have detected gravitational waves? I think I was traveling on that day, but you know. And I came back here, I believe, on on the day after, and I was wandering around the building and people were sort of whispering and looking over their shoulders about you didn't want to spill it. So they were saying, Did you hear? Did you hear? Or have you seen it? What do you think? And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. And they said, Yeah, but it's like there's a, there's an event that looks really real. Like, Whatever. I don't have time for this nonsense. I got things to do. <laughs> Why were you more interested? Like, this could be it, right? You've been working for like a decade. So that's what the, that was the first reaction. I don't have time for all this nonsense. So it was, but, but then after just going over the data again and again, and of course another thing. So it might be a spurious signal. Not only that, if. Is, is it some crazy student cooking up something somewhere? Maybe they have hit something because it, so it's the career of so many students depend on this particular discovery. If it is not discovered, that means there's so many pieces and pieces are involved in it. So we have to like explore every possibility to just zero down to the fact that it is actually a genuine discovery. And that's why when it was first detected in September 2015, the data was not released for the next five months until people were absolutely sure. And it's not just one person, it's the entire collaboration of nearly thousand people who uh, analyze the data to uh, finally release the uh, results in 2016. So how does the signal look like? I, uh, if you put it in a speaker, you put this particular thing in a speaker, you will uh, hear that particular sound. So it's from the merger. The two black holes are initially far apart. It's called the in spiral phase. Then it's merging, and then the signals become 
they increase in amplitude as well as in frequency and finally they merge into a single object whose mass is so this capital m the single object has a mass lesser than m1 plus m2 the difference is emitted as gravitational waves so the for example the first one it was like uh, 65 solar masses and the final object is like 59 so probably 5 to 6 solar masses was uh, or maybe 3 to 5 solar masses were emitted as gravitational waves so 3 to 5 solar mass means 10 to the power 33 grams and multiply by c square so we can imagine the amount of energy emitted in gravitational waves and in order to model so there has to be appropriate theoretical models now so once the detector detects this one needs to be sure that these are coming from black holes so that means you have to solve einstein's equations once again that when these moving and inspiring around each other and we have to solve these einstein's equations are highly non-linear equations and therefore we require numerical techniques uh, which is called numerical relativity especially to model this merger phase and so, so there has been a tremendous development also in the uh, theoretical front. So uh, till now I have been talking about the developments in building the detector. Well, one also needs to build mathematical models to, that, to infer about the masses. How do we know that these are 230 solar mass objects? That's because if we consider 230 solar mass objects and then uh, obtain the signal, solve Einstein's equations with that 30 solar mass objects and then the kind of signal it will generate and suppose there are 260 solar mass or 220 solar mass objects they will generate a different kind of signal so each signal you have to fit in with the observed signal to deduce information about the object so that is how it all came about so then since 2015 there have been nearly 50 confirmed detections of gravitational waves and not only merging black holes so Merging black holes are easiest to detect, but then there are merging neutron stars. So neutron stars are also dead stars, but they are not exactly, uh, so if they can be seen, black holes cannot be seen because they do not emit any light of their own, but neutron stars can be seen and I will not, so and these are much smaller objects compared to black holes. You, should, you see that these black holes were like 30 solar masses, somewhere like 10, 50 solar masses, but neutron stars our maximum mass can be like 1.5 to 2 times the mass of the sun. And since these neutron stars, these are no more, so these are, they can also emit light. So you can see that whenever these are two neutron form another neutron star or a black hole. And there is an associated supernova explosion. It is another violent event. And that leads to a huge release of electromagnetic signal electromagnetic uh, energy so now the energy is in the electromagnetic domain as well as in the gravitational domain and the amount of energy in the supernova is like 10 to the power 52 53 hours per second that is the luminosity so let's see this event two neutron stars merging in spiraling coming closer and closer and finally merging and then you have this supernova. It's releasing about 10 to present in the galaxy. So, merger of neutron stars gives us the scope for multi messenger astronomy. What is multi messenger? We can see the same object in from using gravitational waves, so GW signals as well as EM, electromagnetic signals. So now, sources of gravitational waves uh, detected so far, these are from compact binary mergers, like right? compact binary mergers means merger of black holes, <coughs> merger of neutron stars, or one neutron star, one black hole. And this is how the waveform looks like. But there can be other sources of gravitational waves. For example, there is a neutron star, there is a special kind of neutron star called pulsar. And pulsars rotate at very high speeds. The rate of rotation is constant and it is very accurate, it does not change. But there are deformations on the surface of this object, it is not perfectly sphere. But because it is rotating, you know that from Einstein's theory that 
there is this uh, they will curve the space time around it and it since it is rotating therefore at different points and because there are inhomogeneities there will be the variations in the uh, curvature caused in the surrounding space time these will propagate through the space and it will also give rise to gravitational waves these kind of gravitational waves are called continuous gravitational waves so let's see uh, the complete so this is how it should be such gravitational waves have not yet been detected mathematical modeling so there is a prediction that suppose they are detected they will we, if we play the signal in the uh, speaker it will hear like this then there is stochastic gravitational waves so stochastic means uh, uh, random from random sources there is these sources are moving so the astronomical objects are huge they are huge masses and they are always moving around in space and therefore whenever these are massive objects are moving they are creating ripples and there has to be there will be continuous background of gravitational waves and that is called stochastic this is also not detected by ligo it's very difficult to detect ligo is not sensitive enough to detect these stochastic gravitational waves we have to increase the sensitivity of the detectors to get the background signal let's hear this so this is how it it's expected again this stochastic is also not detected then the last one is burst gravitational wave so this is like we do not even know there can be other ways of uh, obtaining gravitational waves which can in turn reveal new physics which uh, we we are not yet aware of suppose we are detecting some signal from my uh, binary mergers and then there is in suddenly there is one gravitational wave signal and then so this comes in bursts due to some sudden events and then when you try to trace back how it all came it might so this is expected to reveal new physics which we are still not aware of which we do not expect so now coming to the future of gravitational wave astronomy the future is indeed very very bright so with the present detector what expect so these are these merger of black holes and neutron stars these are very uh, these are not very rare events as we have noted that Uh, the moment, uh, so you have also heard from uh, Professor Rana Degari's uh, interview that he said that the moment the detector, light like detector, became operational, the signal, the first signal was picked up. They were expecting that they will have to wait for a few months to get the first uh, detection, but it was not like that. So they are quite uh, common, and one expects to see hundreds and thousands of new detections. So that is. from mergers of uh, sources but there are then other sources like uh, continuous gravitational waves from pulsars and uh, stochastic the background uh, and so on so we have our ground based detectors ligo and borgo which are operational at this point ligo india is proposed uh, and uh, there is ongoing work kagura in japan einstein telescope it's the third generation uh, ground based telescope so ligo india kagura einstein telescope these are all future telescopes and these are all ground based even einstein telescope is ground based so it's a third generation ground based telescope which is expected to be operational by 2025 to 2030 and it will have a much it will have a more increased sensitivity then we have the so there are propositions for the space based missions like decibo decibo and lisa so decibo is interferometer gravitational wave observatory and lisa which is the laser interferometer space antenna so these will be launched in space and why is it necessary so one point which we need which i need to emphasize the light wave detectors are sensitive to frequencies of the order of uh, hundreds of tens to hundreds of hertz <coughs> so those objects which emit gravitational wave signals in that frequency only can be detected by light but suppose there are uh, gravitational waves from supermassive black holes say so 10 millions and billions of solar masses they will emit gravitational waves of the order of of the frequency millihertz so we have hundreds of hertz here and that will be millihertz 
So that cannot be detected by LIGO because LIGO is not sensitive to that particular uh, frequency. That is why the need to build LISA and then, so LISA is sensitive to millihertz order and this decigo is sensitive to SP hertz, 0 0.1 to uh, yeah, one, maximum 1 hertz order. And these are also expected to be operational by 20, in the next 2030s and 2034. So the future prospect with gravitational wave astronomy is very bright and lot of new physics is expected and we are also expecting to know more about fundamental physics the nature of strong gravity because gravity is, uh, the Einstein's gravity although it's a very successful theory there are places it fails for example the black hole there is a singularity the black hole singularity there are other places also Einstein's theory there are some problems in the theory so is there something more fundamental since we are Moving the strongest regime because this merger is the strongest regime. We, are, we can expect that if we can get these signals, we can get to know more, more, uh, more about the nature of uh, gravitational interaction. So earlier when we were considering weak gravity, Newton's law is perfect. In the most stronger regime, black holes are not. We could not apply Newton's law, so we have to consider Einstein. Suppose we go to an even stronger regime. Is Einstein's theory perfect? Or is, do we need some modifications to that? So in order to understand that, we need observations. We need proper signals. And this, the prospect with these gravitational wave detectors, so these detectors are expected to give us those signals which will, which will tell us more about fundamental physics as well. And also, of course, more about our universe. So with this, I would like to thank you all for uh, your patience and uh, for giving me this opportunity to give a talk here. And I'll be happy to address questions. Excellent, ma'am. Excellent. Uh, that's what Professor said. Uh, uh, I'd request our uh, viewers, if you have any query, please, uh, you can unmute your mic and ask questions if you have any doubt. Yes, 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 uh, yes. Mandapadhaj, we can hear you. Just, uh, re just reduce the volume, and uh, you can switch on your video. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, uh, madam, uh, madam, you have very bad clearly uh, about gravitational waves. May I ask you, ma'am? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. If I could convey the basic idea. Uh, yes, madam. Thank you very much for your long speech to make it clear. But I have a little bit, just no question, but I have a little bit uh, uh, more transparent manner for the different needs of the common people. Firstly, the gravitational wave is one kind of vibrational wave. Am I good, madam? Gravitational wave is? Gravitational wave is one kind of I, I could not hear it. It's one side of? One side of vibrational wave. How wave? Something like that. Vibrational Okay. Good afternoon, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Second question. Let me finish that. Let me finish that. And now the vibrational wave is on there. And now the LIGO detector. Right now, detect the whatever you mentioned in your speech. The LIGO detector is a parameter. That is the uh, uh, gravitational wave by following the analogous to uh, Michelson Moldy speed of light experiment. And by the speed of light experiment, Michelson Moldy experiment, but the water flow is taking river of water flow. Michelson Moldy experiment and, and, and similar manner like LIGO in the same instead of mirror, uh, mirror is there. But what happens, uh, one time the photometer, uh, photometer one time dark when the gravitational light is not here, but when the gravitational light is there, the light is accepting, when the light is visible there. So my right. question is, uh, LIGO interferometer is analogous to Michelson Moldy experiment. Um, are you agree with me, ma'am? Yes, yes, it's a very, it's a much improved version of the, so let me now, I will emphasize on this part once again to address your question. So it's a, of course, at the heart of it, it's a Michelson interferometer. 
absolutely. But it is uh, much more improved than the Michelson's uh, original impurity. Madam, uh, you have uh, mentioned that uh, gravitational mass and inertial mass. Correct. Uh, gravitational mass and uh, inertial mass. Ma'am, in theory of relativity, two frames are there. Or any kind. Any One is inertial and one is non inertial. Okay. Madam, am I understanding? Are you saying that? Very clearly. Not clearly. Okay, okay, ma'am. Not very clear. Madam, sir, can you speak near the mic slowly so that? Though you are audible, but it's not clear enough. Uh, one thing that can be done is you can type your question. Yeah. And Ralph, uh, sir, can just uh, uh, he, he, you can just uh, uh, tell me what the question is. How can I help you? Uh, you can uh, put the question in the chat box. Uh, in the chat box, maybe yeah. I will st uh, stop sharing then. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Uh, uh, by the time, uh, Bandhapad, sir, you please uh, type uh, your question in the chat box so that I will pass it down to uh, Indrani, ma'am. Indrani, ma'am, uh, from my side, one question. Actually, uh, you have mentioned mirrors are suspended with silica frame. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, the specific reason uh, for this trend, uh, why you were suspended with silica frame? Uh, Since to reduce the so if you have so there are so many sources of background noise, you see. Yeah, yeah. So it's to clean out those things. The mirrors yeah. have to be cushioned. Yeah, yeah. Have to be cushioned. So they have to be there has to be springs so, so that even if there are vibrations from the earth, yeah. so it should be cushioned. It should not happen here. So the mirror should not feel the vibrations of the earth. That's they should move. So that is no silica is also there for that reason. To cancel out the noise as much as possible. Yes. Yes. Bandhapadeh sir. Myself, Jyotiranjan Panda. Okay, okay, sir. Bandhapadeh sir, please mute your mic. Ah, yes. Jyotiranjan. I'm audible. Yes, yes. Jyotiranjan, you are audible. Yes, he's audible. Please go ahead. Madam, I'm talking about that. How do you hear this question from side to side? No, again, I cannot hear it. Somebody, uh, I think cannot somebody hear is playing the background music. Uh, who is that? Can you? Actually, no. my mobile is playing, so just give me a while. I will uh, switch it off and uh, I'll just come, okay? Yeah. So, please excuse me. Uh, Jyoti Ranjan ji, uh, you can ask. Uh, I'm sorry for this interruption. Yeah, yeah. Madam, yeah. uh, uh, ma'am, uh, good evening, ma'am. Yes. Uh, you can even, while you are asking the question, you can also type it in the chat box. So, uh, irrespective of whether I can clearly uh, hear you or not, I can uh, at least uh, see it and try to answer your uh, question. Audible, yes, yes, audible. Uh, audible was not very clear. Please ask your question. How the 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 How the
here's the questions. So why don't you type it?
so that's one thing the other thing is that electromagnetic waves can be attenuated it can be absorbed suppose a source emits some electromagnetic signal at some point in the universe it can be absorbed while it travels through the interstellar medium it can be uh, there can be dispersion there can be so many other things so as a result of which the if you want to because of these effects the correct information about the source from electromagnetic signal is difficult to uh, extract so you have to keep to take into account so many effects for gravitational waves there is no such problem of attenuation and all these things so that is why they are more purer signals you can get a greater information and a better information about the source and again one more question from jyotira rajesh panda ji is it longitudinal or uh, transverse wave light wave so it's a long it's not long it's it's not about longitudinal transverse okay so that concept so so you are basically considering like uh, sound waves or light waves light wave is transverse sound waves are vibrations along the direction of propagation so it's longitudinal this is so you see how how is sound wave created it's because of the pressure differences right something is vibrating somewhere and then it creates pressure differences in the medium and then it just propagates so that medium is itself in in, in some space right and suppose you're sitting on a chair and the chair starts vibrating you are in some space and the space starts oscillating it's it's the idea is like that and but the speed of propagation of gravitational waves is the speed of light because again it has to be consistent with our special and general relativity and no signal can travel faster than the speed of light so it's the same speed and now again the same uh, related question can it be both longitudinal or transverse can it be both uh, means uh, gravitational waves can it be both uh, longitudinal or transverse you see the concept of longitudinal and transverse so it's the direction of propagation Right? So something is a wave. So suppose you have something vibrating. So it's vibrating and it's also moving. That vibration is moving in the space. So suppose something is moving in the space and it's vibrating like this. It's moving in this direction and vibrating also along the direction at the same direction. It's longitudinal. Okay? Something is vibrating, moving in this direction but vibrating perpendicular to it. It's transverse. Suppose if the space is vibrating, it is a different kind of motion altogether, right? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, not, not very clearly audible. Can you just type it once again? It will be better. For uh, some reason, I cannot hear uh, things very clearly. The questions, in particular. Can you hear your microphone, ha, Susan? Yeah. Yes, yes. Now, now it is better. Madam, one thing is that the light wave is considered as an electromagnetic wave, and that travels in a straight line. Yes. Take the case that it is not a magnetic field. Whether it is due to the pressure wave, which is happening, then whether it is due to the nature of the longitudinal or transverse motion. Cannot hear it. Especially if it is audible. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, your audio is low, audible, but not at all. Um, uh, clear enough. So I just want to know what you want. Okay, let's go. Yes. Can you repeat? Yeah. Can you type? Yes. 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 Yes.
let this only let me put the thread and uh, unmute and say